words can be said about Howard. Howard is a cultural anthropologist who is professor emeritus at the Center for Family and Preventive Medicine at the University of Oklahoma. I have, I have a few words to describe Howard which I've been saying for a while. He is the Renaissance man of psychohistory. And Howard publishes in so many different subject areas. He has volumes of poetry, one of which can be purchased here. He's written on the history of Oklahoma. Um, he's written on health medicine, the history of family medicine, organizational dysfunctioning and downsizing, Slavic American history, um, Soviet and Russian relations, cyclonic study of organizations, Jewish history, the unconscious and family groups, poetry, and he's written stuff on something on Trump too, am I right? And he has more books published than I have time to read about. And no matter what is happening in Howard, for Howard, he is extremely productive at all times. And how many projects are you, book projects are you working on now? Um, I'm working on a book to sit on for a I've written a number of things. Uh, on, it's called Poetry at Work. It is a book uh, built around organizational poetry I've written for two and a half decades. Okay. And it, it is essentially a triad of poetry, and then I write the experiences behind the poems, and then he writes a psychoanalytic uh, interpretation of the whole thing uh, from a number of psychoanalytic viewpoints. And so we have two of his books that are available to purchase that one. And Howard today is speaking on stuff that relates to this. He's going to be speaking on organizational poetry as a portal to understanding organization, society, and history. Can you can start now, Howard, or we can see if the mic's going to be coming soon? Uh, I, I'll try. OK. okay. for my newly diagnosed Parkinson's is to speak with intent. So um, I am now going to try to speak with intent as if I had a microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Of course, I say in Oklahoma, can you all hear me? I'm going to start with a poem. It's called Conventions. In June, the next June is not soon enough. One convention, four airplanes to and from. Three days of muted ecstasy seeing you once again. Time for what we call visiting and catching up. Eyes locked in embrace like a telescope phoned to its star. The unsaid more palpable than the spoken inducing me a sharp pang of arrhythmia. Then there are the presentations, unlike anywhere else. Here the undiscussable is set out in the open. At meeting's end, we return to our lives. At parting, our hugs linger. We bid each other to take good care of yourselves. Then the longing sets in until June, a year away. My topic this morning for the next 50 or, or fewer minutes is organizational poetry as a portal to understanding organization, society, and history, and I should add the kitchen sink. Now, um, 
one of the many hats I wear is a, a anthropologist. And uh, I have learned from Lloyd de Moss the notion of group fantasy as a kind of a subterranean connector of all kinds of things, including institutions in a society. Um, an anthropologist whom I still admire, even though she is kind of in disrepute, is Ruth Benedict, who came up with the idea in the 1930s, before I was born. Uh, the idea of a cultural ethos, a kind of cultural stream that cross-cuts institutions like politics, law, religion, art, cosmology, on and on and on. Now, instead of giving you a studied argument about how you should kind of prove that connection, I only have to refer to you the phenomenon of Donald, Donald Trump, where there's the connection between organizational, society, politics, history, and of course, psychohistory. <laughs> Why poetry? Why poetry in, in relation to psychohistory? I'm going to start with William Carlos Williams, a poet I greatly admire, who wrote a poem called Asphodel, that greeny flower. A few of its lines read, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Now, you notice, and I'm not going to deconstruct it, you notice he didn't say throw away your newspaper. He said go ahead and read the newspaper, but there are things about life about culture about the world that you can't get from the newspaper, or another way of putting it, that you can't get from lineal, positivistic narrative. Now those are dirty words. Those are circumscribed words for one way of knowing. And what I'm going to be arguing is that poetry and film and music and painting, and so on, are all different ways of knowing the same kind of phenomenon. It's, it's kind of, I don't know, the metaphor of a surveyor. The camera reminds me of a surveyor's tripod. You look at the same phenomenon from different vantage points. Now, I, I'm going to steal for a minute from my really first love, that of classical music and say, if you want to understand Russia or the Soviet Union under Stalin, you better listen to the music of Dmitry Shostakovich. Read all kinds of learned tomes, but listen to that music. And if you want to understand the even broader sweep of Russian history, and boy, don't kill me for this generalization. Listen to Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov, for if you know that opera, you will get at the soul of Russia. And I could go on forever with musical analogies. <coughs> Let me go on with the words of a great musician, Gustav Mahler. And I will translate from his German in a, in a letter he wrote in 1896. For myself, I know that as long as I can summarize my experience in words, I would certainly not make any music about it. Now, I would paraphrase that to say, if I can summarize all my experience in narrative, then I would certainly not need to write about poetry. Or if I can make, borrow, and steal from Molly Castillo, my dear friend, the film Bamak's Room 
which she has presented here a number of times and which has won awards, is a necessary complement to reading Van McWilkin's clinical and psychopolitical work. It gives an aspect of Vamic that gets to the heart of his writing and say, oh, now I understand what he wrote and why he wrote. So poetry is a different way of knowing psychohistorical data, psychohistorical experience. Now, I look like a bookseller, and of course, I'm plugging my own books. But in addition to that, I urge you to take a look at Wounded Centuries, which David Blaisel edited and published a couple of years ago. It contains five or six or seven poets who are writing on psychohistorical themes. And they are, to my reading, as essential as reading the psychohistory in psychohistorical texts. To take it even further, um, Paul Elevitz in Cleo Psyche, and David Lotto, and Susan Hine in the Journal of Psychohistory also publish poetry as well as scholarly articles. And the why of psychohistory is in part answered by poetry. Um, to borrow a cliché, you know, Freud said that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, and the word royal road has been usurped so many times for just about anything. Well, I'm going to add that poetry is a royal road to psychohistory. And there are two ways of approaching poetry, from the outside and from the inside. One is reading the poetry written by a historical figure, or the listening to the music, or looking at paintings, and so on. And I'm going to draw on my terrible memory for Slavic history, but I think that a very famous um, Polish poet, and I'm going to do terrible with his name, Adam Mishkevich, was a wonderful lyricist of, poet, po of Polish nationalism. Now you can read all kinds of things, including by Hans Kahn on Pan-Slavism and nationalism, but if you want to get to the soul of Polish nationalism, you ought to take a look at that poetry as well. The second way of approaching poetry in psychohistory is to write it yourself. And not everybody qualifies, because what you need to do is what the, what the Southern Baptists do. It's called immersion. Anthropologists also do it. You immerse yourself in a culture, in a historical era, so that at a certain point, you start thinking and feeling and writing like they do. A story I've told before, and you'll forgive me if I'm repeating myself. Rudolf Binion, one of the great psychohistorians of the founding generation, wrote a lot of stuff on Hitler and the Second World War. And he told me a story that he was trying to understand um, the, the military decisions that Hitler made. And he got inside of the soul of Hitler so well that he was able to predict a particular military strategy before he read what Hitler did about it. Now, that, again, an N of one does not prove anything. But the idea of immersing yourself in a in a world in order to 
finally be able to see it up close and from a plane at 33,000 feet is something that you only get by immersion. The other side of immersion is that good old psychoanalytic term, countertransference. Uh, using your own emotional reaction to understanding something. In addition to observing, in addition to looking <coughs> on, you can, through countertransference, look from within. Now, I want to skip. I always take too long for things. I want to skip to a, a letter that James Krantz wrote to me several years ago. He had been at a conference of the International Society for the Psychoanalytic Study of Organizations, ISBSO, in 2005, where I presented, uh, not a paper, but a, a poetry session on knowing organizations psychodynamically through poetry. Uh, a little bit like I'm doing today, except much more updated now. And later on, I found out that in his subsequent presentation at the same conference, he drew on my poetry. And so while I was working on this new book with Seth Alcorn called Poetry at Work, I wrote to Jim and asked him, can you remember back in 2005, when I was still in training pants, uh, that, that you used some poetry of mine. And can you tell me anything about that? Well, he wrote back, he said, well, I don't remember the poetry. I do remember vividly your presentation and drawing from it. But this is what he wrote to me. Poetry by which I mean poetic communication is essential for me in my consulting work. It takes conversation out of the obsessional, sterile, positivistic, scientistic language that, in my view, debases organizational conversation. While people want solutions, they are also desperate for meaning. And that's quite a contrast. Meaning that imbues action and poetic language is a way of capturing meaning. So what I want to do is read a number of poems. I have some other things that I'd like to do. Do you need to do something? Is this better or worse? Stand, stand a little closer. That's better. That's better. I'm hearing myself with an echo. Um, I'm going to read a number of poems and in terms of some other things that are my way of looking at organizational psychodynamics and organizational psychohistory through poetry. And I might add, as a scholarly aside, I did my homework with, with journals. And in 1993, I published a, a, a journal. I published an article in the Journal of Psychohistory called Organizational Psychohistory. I didn't realize that. Um, the first poem is ostensibly about the age of Trump. But it could also be about a subject that is very near and dear to my bitter heart called downsizing, outsourcing, re-engineering, re, re restructuring, and all those things that we've known since the early 80s. This is called Slash and Burn. Nightfall, then midnight, endless night, no hope of dawn, dawn. None can see in this piercing darkness. New words, new phrases impose new reality. Cloudless sky is downpour. Falsehood is truth. Disagreement is betrayal. Open doors slam shut. 
frantic refugees turned away, not far from Lady Liberty's beckon. The new president promises new walls to shut out more escaping aliens, whispers, dubious election, more like a coup. I choke on my words. Nothing can come out except voiceless dread. <clears throat> Night engulfs all light. Nothing escapes its maw. Fear victorious, death triumphant, furies rule the night. This is a poem that I actually submitted to the Journal of Psychohistory a month or two ago. It's called Welcome. Welcome to the land of no hope but dread of no listening but shouting, of no hope but hate, of no safety but cowering. Welcome to the unwelcoming land where trust is shipwrecked on the craggy shoals of bitterness and revenge. Good morning to a bloody sun, good evening to a crimson moon, and good night to weeping stars. The universe no longer knows what to make of us, nor do we as every stranger feel, fears assault from those who feel assaulted by every stranger. Who will extend the first arm of reconciliation to bridge the trenches we have dug with our shovels of contempt? The hour is late, but dying is always possible. A psychoanalytic organizational friend of mine, William Sander, sent me the manuscript of a huge tome on corporate greed. I don't know, 10 years ago. He asked me what I thought of it. We've been friends a long time in this organization, ISPSO. And he knew I was a poet and had read poetry at his organization. He said, Howard, if you, can, if, you, if you get moved, maybe write a poem about the book. Well, I wrote a poem about the book called Corporate Greed, which I'll read in a minute. And he said something to the effect that my book is 500 pages long, and you captured the whole sphere of the book in one poem. He wanted to include it in the book, but for what turned out to be various legal reasons, not having to do with me, but for um, fearing lawsuits from the various organizations he wrote about, he wasn't, in it, he wasn't able to include the poem. But still, he thought enough of it to tell me that story. Corporate greed, a fantasy. The corporation has a body a hungry body. The corporation has a mouth, a chief executive mouth, and not far below it, a hungry maw, incapable of being filled. The chief executive mouth is urged on toward greater consumption by the many other parts of the body, accountants and bankers, attorneys and consultants, directors and securities dealers, regulators and financial analysts and shareholders. The chief executive mouth feeds the corporation until at last the corporation, wasted away, still empty, has consumed itself. The great theorist of restructuring and deregulation and outsourcing and downsizing and all of those words claim that they all turn around the organization, make it productive, make it profitable, make it efficient, as in the Six Sigma black belt ideology. But in fact, study after study has shown how all of these things end up to a great extent consuming and destroying the very corporations that they're supposed to turn around. This poem is called Downsizing. I wrote it 
way back in 2000. And if you read the back of the newspaper rather than the front of it these days, because downsizing isn't new news, it's old news, what you discover there's as much downsizing now as there was in the 80s and 90s. So 2000 is the same thing as 2017 in terms of the downsizing ethos. What is happening has not happened, and if it has, we do not want to know. People I worked with yesterday, today are suddenly whisked away. No one asked where they go, or really even wants to know. There is no blood to show for all their disappearance. They just are not around anymore. The signs all read the same on the highways and the stores, on the elevators in the halls. What is happening has not happened. And if it has, we do not want to know. <clears throat> Some of my friends and relatives tell me that in photographs I rarely smile, that I should lighten up, that I shouldn't be so damn serious. Well, every so often I come across with a poem that borders on being a little humorous. Now this one is still bitter, but it's humorously bitter. And all of you work and have worked at workplaces, and I bet you anything that what I'm going to read is going to be true for you. It's called Rules. For the newcomer to this workplace, there are rules to learn. Explicit rules, unstated rules, conscious rules, unconscious rules, official rules, informal rules, rules that are spoken, rules that are undiscussable, rules that make sense, rules that make no sense, but are supposed to make sense. Your main job is to obey them all. And you thought you only came here to work. More humor from Stein, that's it. <laughs> I'm a hopeless case, I'm sure. There's an enormous business and managerial literature on what's called transformational leadership. We've read about it since the 90s. Chainsaw Al Dunlap of Sunbeam, Neutron Jack Welch of General Electric, on and on. People who were brought on by shareholders, by boards of directors, to rescue an organization that is surely going downhill. Now, it made a profit last year. It's been going uphill for years and years and years. But the, the slope is not this, but it's this. And that ain't good enough. So you bring along a trans transformational leader who will turn it all around by getting rid of the dead wood, by getting rid of the, the, the fat, trimming down the muscle to the bone. These are not phrases I've originated with. And getting rid of the old, because the old was only the source of what is wrong with the organization, even though it showed a profit, and gave shareholders some change in their pockets, but not enough. That gets back to corporate greed, the earlier problem. I was talking with my friend Seth Alcorn on the phone. I had been talking with him on the phone and by Skype for probably, I don't know, 10 years. We've worked on a bunch of papers on deregulation, did a book that's out there called The Dysfunctional Workplace, available for purchase. Um, he wrote the foreword to the second edition of my new book called Listening Deeply. It's also out there. And he's had the habit over the last almost 30 years, during our conversations, before there was Skype on the phone and email, we'll talk about something. He said, Howard, 
I think there's a poem there. I often try to shrug it off and say, this is called projective identification. Don't shove your poetry ideas down my throat. But after I think about it for three seconds, he's right. Transformational leadership. Again, think of this not as, this is Howard Stein's poetry. No. Howard Stein's attempt to get inside the soul of organizational cycle history from the 1980s through now. The new CEO arrived with a flare, like a god on a chariot, this shaman of change. He followed Nietzsche's dictum that great creators must be great destroyers. Shiva in the flesh, he drilled down his will into the soul of the organization. <coughs> replacing their thought with his thought until only his thought remained. One corporation, one mind, one will, walks the awe, the culture a cult, a divine kingship. His power glittered as the gold of productivity, of profit, of perfection, a well-oiled machine submitting to only one machinist. Besides him, there is no corporation. There is only I. <clears throat> let's, flip, let's flip transformational leadership over and look at the victims of downsizing, the survivors who have to do two jobs for one with the same pay or less. Invisible, words for the pain unacknowledged by those who inflict it and by those lucky enough to have survived until the next wave. Leaden words, wooden words, magical words, <coughs> recited like an incantation. Downside, right side, riff, redundant, restructure, re-engineer, outsource, offshore, de-skill. People disposed of like trash for profit. Not folks, but figures, lives ground into dust. Hopes and dreams, livelihoods and worlds turned out into the street, forgotten. Did they ever work here? Sacrificed on the altar of the sacred shrine of the bottom line. One more poem. which is actually based on a real event that I was part of in which uh, three colleagues and I walked through the, several years later, walked through the hospital we had studied for a year in its uh, mammoth downsizing efforts. Where is the blood? Night at corporate headquarters Four of us who studied the company's downsizing walk silently through a long, dim-lit, blank, cream-painted corridor, a place where phantoms dwell and wait, a place where walls seem to close in on us. We all look around as if we're looking for something. After about 20 paces into this <coughs> antiseptic cave, I ask aloud, where is the blood? My three friends say they were thinking the same thing. A consultant team, all in black suits, had recently studied the financial books and recommended to the CEO they could save lots of money and make the company look good to shareholders by firing a thousand employees immediately, for starters. Mandatory downsizing to keep the company alive a necessary sacrifice for the sake of the company. The leader said to those gathered in a locked auditorium before they were ordered to stand in long queues of people processing personally, efficiently, in a well-oiled machine, and finally escorted to the parking lot, never to return. The four of us knew the stories, see it unfold before us again in that cavern, as we walk and relive it, 
The walls and carpet bleed, cover our shoes and clothes in still warm, thick crimson blood, like a horror <coughs> The story hovers in the air. Its ghost will not leave. It speaks to us with great sadness. Even the ghost could not rid itself of the memory, could not abandon the prison of knowing too much. The four of us look at each other, the story alive in all of us, bathed in fresh blood. We leave the building and re-enter the night, carrying the hall's darkness with us. We had been through the mass firing even before it happened. We knew too much. The blood will not wash off. Not now. Maybe never. In the remaining time, in the remaining time, in the remaining time, I would like us, can you still hear me? Yes. In the remaining time, I would like to turn my presentation into a very brief workshop. And this may bomb, it may not work, but I'm going to try it. We have about 15 minutes left. I've done this a number of times including with the Convention of the American Psychological Association, the consulting division. And I, I tried the experiment on for size because I want this to be yours and not just mine, sitting, sitting and listening to me for 45 or 50 minutes. So what I'd like you to do for five minutes, this is going to be a terrible quick exercise. Take out a piece of paper, or a notepad, or a smartphone, or a tablet, or a laptop, and start writing a few lines about a place you work, a place you've worked at. And if you don't want to work, write about a workplace, write about, say, Dave Bizell who studies the Second World War for a million years and, and knows it in my memory. So if you want to write about something else, you can write about that. But what I would like you to do is to write the beginning of a poem. And after the five minutes, if you feel like sharing, I'd like you to read what, what you've written. And, and say a little bit about where, where you're coming from. I know this is terribly rushed, but I want the rest of this session to be yours, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> 